here all alone in Curtis's haunted house with his cat or puppy George. Welcome to Two Guys and Some Horror. Curtis, how you doing? I'm doing good. Doing I'm good. Uh, I'm happy that we're here together live recording versus over the internet because sometimes that can be a bummer. No. Yeah. So uh, this is going to be one of our sessions where we start knocking out two episodes at once. I, I wanted to give a good shout out to uh, to Cindy, especially for showing some excitement for the change link. Uh, we did indeed watch it. Tonight, we're going to discuss The Changeling as well as House 2. Now, normally we, we discuss the, the good movie first or and then go into the bad movie, but I, I like to kind of go start with the bad movie and then kind of go into the good thing, what everybody, I guess, would rather hear about. So we're going to talk about House 2 starting out. Curtis, what, what is your main opinion of House 2? I think it's a fun movie. I think uh, hanging out with your friends, watching this movie on a Friday night, Saturday night kind of situation, which we tend to do a lot of these where we're like, oh man, it would be good at a party, that kind of feel. Um, I, I literally sat and laughed throughout most of the film. This is just, it's more of a comedy to me than a horror. Um, and it's, you know, we were talking about this before. It's nothing like House. Absolutely nothing like House. It's not at all. Uh, house was panned as a mediocre slash kind of bad horror films back in the uh, 80s, 90s. And House 2 kind of came out. It has nothing to do with the first movie whatsoever. So if you watch this movie without even seeing the first house, you'd be completely fine. Uh, it's a kind of a horror comedy, and I think you could even watch this with your kid and you wouldn't have any issues. There's no blood. There's no real gore. There's no nudity. It's kind of just a a fun flick that I don't really know if you could classify it as horror, but it has horror in the, the genre. So what this film is, you, you have this, this kind of uh, yuppie couple. They go to this house that's been in this gentleman's family for years, and they, for whatever reason, they're housing a Halloween party at some point. And his Which is what ties it into our, this is a choice, Yes. Uh, both these films were chosen for the, the Halloween season. Right. These are the final uh, picks for Halloween, our October picks. Um, and I thought that was great. I thought that was very classy of you to find a movie that actually not only just like tied in Halloween, but actually had a Halloween party. I thought that was a, a lot of fun, too, throughout the film. We had uh, quite a few Halloween parties this month. Uh, I believe even last month we had Bud the Chud 2, which had a Halloween was it a Halloween? It was just prom. It was something. Uh, there was a party there. It was a, I think it was a Halloween party because it was on trick or treat. Yeah. Kids were trick or treating, and I was pissed because the zombies actually blended in, and and that's really why no one noticed that a bunch of zombies were wandering the town. The same thing happens in this movie. These guys on Earth, they're one of their. Uh, he has a dumb friend. He's the com comedic relief. His dumb friend's girlfriend is comes to the house because. The main character's girlfriend at the very beginning does uh, record stuff, and she's trying to get discovered by her. Yep. Uh, there, there are two. I don't, I don't remember the actress's name, but uh, not important. She's, well, she has a memorable face. She, she's been in other things. Uh, Bill Maurer actually is in this film as well. Is kind of the antagonist. Yeah, I got a note on that. He's, <laughs> he's a, he's a pretty big dick. Uh, Bill fucking Mayer, the I say Mayer, you say Ma or whatever, is the music producer dude who gets Jesse into trouble with his girlfriend. What a cock blocking move! Yeah, well, obviously he's into her. I, he wants to kind of prove to her that their boyfriend's a jerk, and he, they anyhow they unearth his dead grandpa, his dead great grandpa, and his dead great grandpa looks like a zombie. He has a kind of like a crystal skull, like the magical crystal skull. And this is kind of what leads into what I feel this movie should have been, like a mini series, if not a TV series. Because there's like three different things that just randomly happen yep. that have no tie in to one another. No, I I mean I felt more like this thing was a nineties video game. I thought right. this was a very classic video game. Um, and it and it was almost made just to have a video game. And I didn't look up whether there was or wasn't, but um, just the feel of it, the different levels, the different um, story hooks. Because right off the bat, Grandpa's like, or Great Grandpa, is like, "Hey, Jesse, I need you to protect this thing in this house." Right. And it's like, okay, cool. Video game premise understood. That's what we're doing. That's a good point. Um, it's very, 
I don't know. It was fun. It was comical to me to watch them kind of go through that stuff. But back to back to the main storyline or synopsis is, um, so he he unearths his great grandfather because he read all this stuff up, mm-hmm. um, and basically they get this crystal skull. Gra- great grandpa asks them to protect it. Great grandpa is still a zombie. Um, he is an undead, uh, you know, creature who's just trying to survive. Basically, uh, I don't I don't even know why he thinks he's young because if you remember right. He's like, let's go out and have a good time. I haven't been out in a while. And then, you know, Jesse and his friend are kind of like, I don't know, Grandpa, I don't know, uh, you know. It was the crystal skull that kind of rejuvenated him and kept yeah. him alive. That Just enough. He kind of explains it. And yeah. he looks at his body and his skin. He's like, oh, I guess it didn't keep me as young as I thought it would. Yeah. Which is kind of disappointing for him because he's he's like, great, now I'm an old... <laughs> I don't know. He's got a couple of really good lines in here. He's, he's, like, he's the best character in the movie. It's... It's not a good movie, but it's... <laughs> I, I would argue his friend from back in the day, the old Western dude with the awesome beard and the like the long mustache lack of or lips and lack of lip. Like I thought he was a really cool character design, uh, especially mm-hmm. for the villain. Because um, throughout this movie, there's a couple of villains that we run into. Like you got the Amazon guy, um, the caveman, the caveman, the the pterodactyl, um, and then you get the old Western dude. Thought that was probably my favorite uh, guy. Right. This uh, this movie is kind of like four different TV episodes of a of a mini series. Starts out, they get to the house, they meet the undead grandpa, Halloween party, uh, ex girlfriend situation. His current girlfriend sees his ex girlfriend talk to him, and she starts kicking and slapping him. Yeah. Which kind of you feel for this guy because he's not in a safe, he's not in a healthy relationship with this woman. She's probably sleeping with her producer boss. I don't. You know, he's better off. Anyhow, that happens. The caveman comes in, just walks in the house, punches a random guy, takes the skull, and goes back mm-hmm. into the Stone Age. And that's your first episode with your cliffhanger. That's amazing. That's Yeah, that's really good. Um, fun quotes here. My great-great-grandson, what year is it? So gra- great-grandpa, great-great-grandpa or whatever, has no idea what, what's even going on. He doesn't realize... You know how fat, how far forward in time they've gone. Walking into this house, um, if he was in the old west, he would know right away. Right, you'd know it's been a long time. Um, I forgot I invited some people over for Halloween. Thought that was a really funny line from the buddy, um, because him and his girlfriend, who are just trying to get a record deal, sure enough, of course they would invite invite a bunch of people over to have a Halloween party. Why not? Um, but then. <laughs> So was Zombie Grandpa getting jumped by the Aztecs? Did you think like did you have as much fun with that scene as I did? Because like the I don't Aztecs, feel, yeah, I don't think he like feels pain when he's getting his ass kicked. He's I think he's still alive. I think he's just really decrepit. I don't think he's actually a zombie. Yeah, I, d- I just don't know if he ever like shows any ounce of like true pain. Like more than anything, he just looks tired. Yeah, he just looks like he wants a long nap. Well, and he's he's drinking a lot of beer and he's watching a lot of old movies and TV yeah. shows. So he, I think he got plenty of rest and he's just you know a little drunk. Yeah, all those beers, drunk driving. His friends, uh, what was that? A it wasn't a Lambo, uh, Ferrari maybe or a Porsche. It might be probably it a was, Porsche. It was definitely an expensive car. Whoever made this movie had money and had no idea what they were doing. No, all that house money. So one of the uh, they're they're cute. Thing that the kids would love their hook to get the kids to like this movie was the caterpillar dog which they meet in the stone age which they also meet a pterodactyl who steals their skull so they have a pterodactyl in their house now they have a caterpillar in the house now and they go in the kitchen and they try to get the skull and you go he's in the pantry and so the guy closes the pantry because bill mauer is like oh what's in there you know he's like oh is is your ex-girlfriend in there and his oh, girlfriend yeah. comes in and it's like this whole Look, we we went back to the Stone Age. We're trying to protect the skull. My dead great grandpa's here. Let me open and show you. And he opens it, and there's his ex girlfriend. There's his ex girlfriend, drunk, drunk. <laughs> drunk off the bottles of whatever she was drinking down in the, the <laughs> think, liquor cellar. I think it was champagne, but she was definitely pretty drunk. Uh, his girlfriend didn't catch him in the act of anything. He probably should have just let Bill Maurer in and said, "Hey, here you go." I, uh, I don't know that the whole concept of that was just kind of dumb. Guy's better off, my personal opinion. 
He's done nothing wrong. All the entire movie, Jesse has done nothing to really actually like he's done nothing wrong. Period. Right. With his girlfriend. But but this producer guy, basically her boss, is making it out like he's some bad guy. She kissed him, the ex girlfriend or whatever, and, and he didn't like let it happen. He pushed her away gently, trying to be nice and, and understand like maybe she doesn't know I'm dating someone or whatever it might be. But and I'm not trying to defend him. Like if someone kisses you, you should probably go and make sure that if your girlfriend saw you or whatever, that it was all taken care of. I, I don't really know how to, to handle that. But the point is, is this guy's done nothing wrong this entire film. But Bill Mayer, for some reason, is out to get him. She was just, well, his girlfriend was beating the crap out of him, too, like after nothing. So yeah, she just she's, whispered to him. and get, like, get out of that relationship as fast as you can. Toxic. Toxic. Anyhow, situation goes, uh, people, the party ends. Everybody's out. The uh, I believe it's day. Then you see the Aztecs who also decide to steal the skull. Yes. And that's when Daniel Ratcliffe, uh, or what's his name in uh, John Ratzenberger? Sorry, John Ratzenberger, Daniel Ratcliffe. They're the same person in my head. <laughs> they both look the same. They both sound the same. They don't at all. But uh, he he comes in as a re- repairman. He's uh, you may recognize his voice in uh, movies like Toy Story. He's he's the pig. He's in actually in all the Pixar movies as a voice. Oh, uh, he was in Star Wars. He was one of the characters who I believe dies as a pilot, and he uh, he's very well known as Cliff Clavin in Cheers. I was gonna say this I is the Cheers from. guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he. He's like repairing the house. He's like, oh, let me check out your light bulb. Breaks the light bulb with a wrench. And then pulls like he pulls a sword out of his bag and fights the uh, Aztecs as well. So fun fact for you. he He's from Cheers. And in the first movie, the first house movie, Norm is from Cheers. And that's the neighbor of the guy who lives in the house. Mm. So very fun flip-flop for you there. The two guys from Cheers, two of the guys from Cheers, both star in House and House 2, just a weird uh, piece of trivia there for you. The and, dynamic Cheers duo. Yep. And uh, I have to say, I really love John Ratzenberger's character way better than Norm's character from the first film. Because he is a swashbuckling like pirate, ready to go, look for treasure. And the dude's just an electrician. He's an incompetent electrician. <laughs> but he's such a good he's adventurer. A, he's a competent adventurer. He's like, oh yeah, I've seen this before. He, he plays Cliff Clavin. This so he, movie, he's click climbing. So he cuts uh, a big ass hole in the wall and sends him in there into the Temple of Doom to go and rescue um, the which girl did they steal? The sleeping Aztec princess? It was some random Aztec girl. Yeah. I, wh- whatever they are, Mayans, Aztecs, whatever. I, it, there's really no context in this film. No. All you need to know is that they also stole the Crystal Skull, and this is another. This is another episode, the the Cliff Clavin episode, where he guest stars in as himself to only he's not a postal worker to save the day which he does you know he he fights off several of these crazed lunatics and they rescue this aztec princess in the most ridiculous fashion yeah i mean the swinging from ropes back and forth the all of a sudden they all know how to fight it's in a single room too yeah it's not a big room at all it's a dungeon, and there's. Uh, it looks like you fall to your death. Like you have no idea what's down there. Right. And they're just perfectly hitting every stone that they can to swing back and forth from, knocking these guys out. One hit wonders. Um, and these are supposed to be strong Aztec warriors. Like right. you would expect a much better fight put up from them. Um, but that's us once again overthinking this scene. It's a '90s video game. They're supposed to be one hits. The only guy who's supposed to last longer than one hit is the guy performing the. Um, whatever he was doing, it's the, the sacrifice. Second, it's the third level of the video game. Yeah, uh, you, you don't want it to be too difficult, but you don't want it to be too hard. You throw more guys at him. You're like, all right, you learned this. Now learn the rope swing. Yeah, that's when he brought it in. Uh, maybe even the fifth level. <laughs> it's because you have the Halloween party as well. You yeah, got the, you got the uh, unearthing the grandpa, survive him shooting you, and then you have the uh, Halloween party. Where did we get to the gorilla yet? The gorilla, no, we haven't. Okay. Because the gorilla, the only fun fact I have about that is that it's Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder? Yeah. One of the uh, gentlemen who played Jason in the Friday the 13th series. So um, I looked up 
you know, I was like, who the hell is playing the gorilla? It's got to be someone good that we've maybe seen in other movies. No, actually, we haven't done any episodes yet, but it's Kane Hodder, and we'll get there eventually, and we'll be able to wrap back around to this one day. But uh, another fun fact with Friday the Third. Uh, Friday the 13th is part 6 features the same music that was used in House 2 so they had very similar soundtracks in fact the same exact songs uh, throughout the film so that was kind of fun to see just some some friendly use of music there between both films good for me um, without going too much further in there spoiling anything or because I mean we get the awesome villain the western villain that would be like episode 4 that would be episode probably episode Five, to be honest because they have the dinner section they have that kind of the filler episode where they're all having dinner together as a family the pterodactyl the uh the caterpuppy the uh the doofus and the guy who the hero now who's just a completely nerdy guy and the aztec princess who's serving the food and is in love with the goofy guy and throws things yeah at the uh yeah so I had nothing to write about that scene because I really like you said was. it's a filler uh, episode slash scene. Well, that's when we get introduced to the gunslinger with Grandpa there, there as we well, go. and yes. that's when he comes in. He he takes the crystal again, and this time everybody gets pew pewed, or the Grandpa gets pew pewed, and they go to the Wild West. It was a great it was a great fight scene. Um, you know, eventually the town police show up. And they get involved, which I thought was really uh, interesting. Um, but other than that, like, it, you know, it had its moments of kind of cool, exciting, but way too drawn out for me for, yep. for, for this kind of a uh, scene. And, and then you still have to tie off the movie. You still have to end the movie because that, that scene doesn't just end it. It's not like, hey, we won victory, whatever. There was still, like, the goodbyes and the... the Right. who's staying, who's going, all that kind of stuff going on at the end of the movie. Well, at the end of the movie, it's like it's kind of like they left it open for a TV series, and I feel I really feel like this was meant to be that at I mean, some if any, point. If anyone out there is listening that actually directs, writes, or works at a film, like, come see us. Uh, we can take House 2 and turn it into something way better. Uh, definitely a six-part Netflix ep- uh, series. Maybe um, add a cohesive plot. Maybe add in better actors. I mean, they didn't do a terrible job, I'll be honest, but they weren't great either. The uh, we could have gotten better. The acting wasn't the problem. It was the direction. I would definitely say that this was quickly created. There was some special effects that looked okay, um, but I feel like it was mediocre. It was meant to be kind of a, a family kids film, and it just yeah. didn't really have good production or what did, direction what did we get for a rating on this did it get like a pg-13 i would assume uh, yeah good. pg-13 mm. comedy fantasy horror okay beautiful i uh, mean it hits all those boxes in my opinion it's definitely fantastical uh it's definitely funny and it has some aspects of horror but i would say it leans more on the comedy side to me I'm looking here house four i didn't even know they made a sequel to house two i thought that would be where they just killed it off no, it looks but, like uh, it goes a little bit further. Yeah, uh, so... Get ready to add that to the list. Curtis, would you recommend House 2? Uh, personally, I, it, was, it was very boring and forgettable. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to your regular person. I'd agree with that. I, eh, it's a bad movie. It, it's just something that... It's kind of like a 90s... You have this loser, his goofy friend, they get into multiple adventures and the loser ends up with a girl and becomes the hero at the end of the at the end of the story. I mean I definitely had fun. I can admit yeah. that, but um, I also know I know that my expectations for a good horror film is a lot higher than that. Um, and I just wouldn't I would put this as like more of a sci fi fantasy than a, than a horror. Yeah. Well, you can't really yeah I, I it's it's not scary at all especially how it's supposed to compare to the first movie which was a horror film yeah um, by all means and a lot more serious in tone uh, anyhow moving on to the changeling thank you Cindy because I have to admit I haven't seen this since I was a kid um, I have fond memories of seeing this VHS cover 
mm-hmm. on my grandmother's bookshelf. Um, the the burgundyish, reddish, maroonish cover with the wheelchair, and always just being creeped out by it. Um, and I definitely don't remember most of this movie from when I was a kid. So I'm really glad that I got to rehash this and rewatch it because it's probably now one of my top ten favorite horror films that I've watched in a long time that list changes obviously quite often because as time goes by certain movies fall out of it that I may have put in it Um, but this is definitely going to be sitting in the top 10 now for at least the next year coming I so I I like this movie I like it but it didn't feel like a a horror film to me it felt like kind of a kind of a mystery film with uh, a cohesive ending a lot of decent acting for sure, and I love the music. The fact that the main character... So, I'm going to spoil a little bit of the film. The main character is... He's a bit depressed. Uh, his his family has passed away, and I feel that they did a really good job of showing the relationship within the first five minutes of the film. And he's kind of living his life as a pianist, as well as, a, as an instructor. He, he teaches like classes of 24 people, and he's also uh, doing concerts and in his house, this new house which he has bought. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very similar theme in this episode. They're both mystical, magical houses. Um, This one a little bit more spectral than mm -hmm. than the other, but yeah, they both... Yeah, that's funny. You don't even theme these episodes on purpose. No. And I feel like they end up having more similarities than what we were expecting, which is really cool. Um, You're getting really lucky. I'm going to tell you that right now. Lucky or uh, (laughs) clever. Anyhow... (laughs) We're, uh, I absolutely love the, uh, I don't know the name of the main actor, but I think he was in, uh, he was in a sitcom for a while, wasn't he? John Russell? George C. Scott. George C. Scott. Uh, he, yeah, he's done a lot. Yeah. Patton, The Hustler, and then Change. Who Dr. Oh, he Strange was Kinderman in, uh, Exorcist 3, which, uh, is another movie we should see at some point. Uh, Maybe have that be our good movie, and Exorcist 2 be, be the bad, bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> Pazuzu. Anyhow, uh, he's moving out of his apartment. He moves into this house, and in there, a lot of mysterious things are happening. And I feel that this movie did a really good job of making everything real. Uh, people who talk, like, psych, they make psychics very real. I think this was coming out of a time where psychic, like, we're still in psychic fever in the nation. Uh, like, the 1970s, and I think 1980 may have been the end of that. But, really solid uh, job of kind of setting ambiance, putting in good music. Uh, one of the things, scenes I really enjoyed was when he, John was playing the piano, and he's playing this tune and then he hears the tune again when he finds spoilers this secret room in the house <laughs> and he's kind of discussing with this the the heroine I guess you would say yeah like, she never... becomes like his best friend I think you're talking yeah. about Claire in the movie right um, basically two people who have never met before but she's the one who helped find the house for him mm-hmm. she works with the school the university they works at and then uh, they get them they get him this house who who everyone is for some reason everyone's got a different twist on why this house is is creepy and no one wants to be in it but no one really wants to say why um sp- you know spooky things have happened but they don't tell anyone like claire had no idea when she listed this house for him she had no idea so it, it kind of is this weird feeling where it's like a town secret almost and they're trying to keep it a secret but in reality, like, the secret's already out. Because when John goes to talk to other people, they explain to him, you know, hey, this is what happened. Um, things like that. So be careful. Um, but yeah, so he finds this spooky room um, with some... Uh, what What's up? What's in there? Um, There's the wheelchair. The wheelchair's in there, and then just spooky sounds, right? Well, the house itself has been giving off spooky sounds before this moment, and they did a really good job of tying in the piano music with that. So this whole movie is about sounds, yeah. in my opinion. Um, I, I took a, a took a note because there's there's some things I love about the sound and some things I really hated about the sound. Like, they use ADR um, a lot in this with the voiceovers. Um, yeah. And I feel like, at the especially at the beginning of this movie, they were very out of sync. 
Um, the ADRs just weren't really well laced. But the one thing that they really nailed was the spectral sounds. Those were terrifying. They uh, they definitely pulled emotion out of you. You you weren't expecting them when they hit for the most part. Um, and like you said, the tie-in with the music, like the spooky piano um, hitting in the creepy house, I was like, oh. And then the plumber hitting the pipes. Ding. Same noise. Yeah. As the key. Yeah. So I was like, this film's going to be probably really good. Because um, I, I, you know, looking at the, the year, looking at the, the synopsis, I'm like, okay, your generic 80s film. It's coming right. late 70s. You know, is when it was filmed. Most likely, I'm like, okay, nothing good really came from the '70s except for uh, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and um, Halloween. Right, and they really hit all the key points. You have a relatable, you have relatable characters. You have a good build up to him. Like in most movies, they they set the ambiance of the film. Like first, they kind of like they show the comfort of the home, and then they, they it slowly becomes more and more creepy. Then you discover the mystery. And then you, as the viewer, you want, you're like you're wondering how how are we going to solve this mystery or how is this going to kind of unfold? Then you see you find out more and more. You don't understand what the house itself wants, and then you meet. I, I don't know if you call him the villain or or what, but maybe the antagonist for for a little while. You meet him, and then it kind of all wraps together. Nobody. I don't know. For are you trying to be spoiler free? Is that what? Well, without without going into spoilers and explaining like what happened to the to this house or what yeah. I heard the ghost is because I feel like this is definitely worth a watch. Uh, I feel like it wrapped up pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't normally like supernatural movies. Yeah. Uh, like put me in a put me in a, a seat and ask me to watch like Paranormal Activity or any of those spooky ghost type movies and I don't like it I, yeah. I it genuinely creeps me out um because it's more realistic to me than like your typical slasher films um you know spooky specters and stuff like that just just really shake me they they make me freak out and this movie did a really good job of that um and I think they did a really good job of portraying the villain as not being the the specter mm. if that's I mean if that's what you're kind of talking about is you you get this so John John goes through this house he he discovers all this information about the house mm-hmm. um, and then ends up going out and actually doing detective work um, to figure out who who was the true like uh, antagonist in this film and in doing so actually uncovers quite a bit of of historical data that was that was just covered up right. And in doing that, it unearths a much larger scandal um, right. in this town, and and you can you can really feel the the weight of it because of the characters who are involved. They show the proper emotion, right. like the proper tone. Um, I mean, <laughs> oh man, it it's just it's creepy when you start to think about stuff like this. I I, I mean, can we? Did can it freak you out? No, <laughs> not really. But I'm very. I don't believe in things, so it's kind of hard for me to kind of get caught into that. I used to, but the one thing I really want to talk about that was done very well, better than most films, is your obligatory ghost movie seance scene. Okay. Yeah. So, not like in Beetlejuice, but not like in Beetlejuice at all. But they so, tried. <laughs> so they have uh, their psychic. She she writes things with a pen and paper. She and like this her assistant or whatever whoever he is. Like, she's asking the ghost questions, and she's filling things out as quickly as possible. That was really well done. That set a very good tone for the film, because at that point, you're discussing with the spirit or the specter in the house itself, and it's just like, once she runs out of paper, it's like, oh, well, what does the house even want? And the house says, help, stop, help, stop. I'm just... What else? I mean, it had it had a bunch of. After he went back and re looked at the papers, you yeah. know, she was writing a bunch of different, um, you know, words. Help and stop were the two primary. Right. But it was like it was like John, like one, Joseph. Joseph, uh, you know, answering questions like, "Hey Joseph, will you work with us or will you talk with us?" And it's like, "Yes, yes, yeah." Like, I mean, that was intense, man. Like, I I felt my heart racing while watching that scene because I'm like 
okay, what's going to happen? Like, something creepy is going to happen. That the jump scare is going to happen. No, nothing. There was nothing like that. It was just... Complete tone. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. It was just none of that standard scary BS that people will throw at you today. It's an actual just... Know what what the right word is, uh, other than like ambiance or the the way it feels you. It's just the movie sets you at unease and it keeps you there right through the end. Yeah, I was listening to another podcast today about that with um, another film. So A Quiet Place. Mm-hmm. Um, that movie has very little dialogue, but I felt on the edge of my seat the entire time. That's exactly what the Changeling does for me personally. Um, the entire movie, I'm like waiting for the shoe to drop you know or waiting for the the specter to come out and and do something and it's like whether or not that ever happened i don't care i'm still on the edge of my seat just anticipating and waiting for something to happen like that um the the breaking of the lock scene so i'm sitting there i'm like don't break that lock man like nothing good is gonna come from you breaking that lock and i wasn't wrong but you know he still you know john lived so breaking the lock didn't kill the guy but at the same time, I mean, it just sent him on that rabbit hole of more shit to go figure out. There's a time and place for a jump scare, but sometimes you don't need them. No, a ball bouncing down a staircase can do it just as easily. Right. Oh my god, get rid of that ball, man. <laughs> just get rid of that ball. Well, it's like this is comparative with, to The Shining, which at some point we will be discussing that. But I don't think there are any... There may have been like one or two jump scares in The Shining, but most of it was kind of slowly set up. Yeah, it was more um, ambiance, suck you in with some good music, some good leading of a character, yeah. and then pop, something happened. The environment itself was yeah. uh, was the terror. So my notes on the scribbling medium was, the scribble medium talk was meh. I was like, it was okay. That piece built up to the broken glass. That's the part. The medium, um, when that freaking glass flew across the screen, oh my god, that, that got me. I was like enthralled. I was like watching because I'm like, okay, these medium, it's going to build up to something. I expected more. I didn't expect just the two psychic scenes. Um, but that broken glass was pretty sweet. I actually want to know how they did that scene because, I don't know, it didn't look like it was on a string or pulley or anything like that. I just, I just, uh, I'm really curious how they ended up doing that scene. Right. Um, <laughs> who are you going to call? A bunch of mediums apparently to tell you what you already know. That's a ghost. Should have called the Ghostbusters. <laughs> like, like I just, oh man, the, that piece, the whole psychic thing, like you're talking about in the late '70s. Now, that makes way more sense because I didn't think about that. Um, I was right. just like, no, typical early '80s, late '70s film, I guess. Hell, uh, Hell Night is one of my favorites. They, they, uh, that one's one. Oh, it's gonna be on the list for you for sure. It's, it's way, <laughs> it's. It's a creepy ass house too. I don't know why I'm thinking about that right now. Why I jumped into my head. It has nothing to do with specters, but that's fine. Uh, creepy mansion. It'll be it'll be fun. We'll we'll do that next Halloween. That'll be a good one. So Curtis, yes. Final thoughts on the Changeling. Um, I don't really know if there's anything else I can say that I haven't already said before. Um, I absolutely loved the film. I thought it was a really good horror film. Uh, it will definitely be on my list for annual rewatches. And, yeah, I think I need to start spreading the word about the Changeling. Get more people to see it. I think, uh, now that I'm thinking back, there was one scene that you could think of as a jump scare, and that's with the wheelchair. But that was that was pretty well done. Otherwise, I would recommend watching this movie at least once. Know where the whole seance kind of trope, it, I would say, was done well. It probably started with this movie. I, I think poltergeist came after but definitely recommend it you could watch this uh with your family i don't maybe not your child if they're under the age of 12 but i think that's a fair yeah especially if your kid loves action or horror um or mystery this, even. or mystery this could be a really fun film for the family to sit down and watch especially this thursday on halloween yeah. future yep. people past people they barely even gloss over the fact that this movie takes place in Halloween at one point. They mention it. They barely gloss. Yeah, but yeah. you don't really see anything related to it. No. So there you go. The Changeling happened on Halloween. 
All right, guys, thank you for listening to us today on Two Guys and Some Horror. You can find us on social media at Curtis, what is the name of our Twitter? And Two Guys Horror Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Um, also, feel free to email us at Two Guys and Some Horror at gmail.com if you have any uh, suggestions, any other suggestions. We got one on Twitter. Cindy, again, thank you for following and thank you for uh, suggesting. I know uh, Mimic, uh, you also on Twitter follow. Um, you're a pretty good friend of mine on, on Twitch, so uh, we'll be getting to your movie soon, I believe. And yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks again. So, two guys, some horror pod. Two guys, horror pod. Two guys, horror pod. At two guys, horror pod on both Instagram and Twitter. Peace out. Bye, Felicia. Oh, uh, what was it? The Catter Puppy? We're here oh, with yeah, the Catter yeah. Puppy George. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, that thing was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm ready.